We're very lucky today to have Nicola Gorobio, who goes by Nick, as, as our guest speaker today. Um, he's a Ukrainian journalist, and he spent uh, several months for the last part of the last year in the eastern part of Ukraine, sort of working as a war correspondent. So I think he has a couple of videos that he wants to show us, including some he made himself. And then he'll give us a sense of what's going on on the ground in Ukraine with a short presentation. So we'll give him the floor for about 30 minutes, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions afterwards. So if you talk too much, I'll probably stop you. OK, open, yeah. Open the floor to press. I, just I need to do this. <laughs> I warned you in advance. But OK, so the floor is yours. So as I understand, everybody has students here, right? <laughs> okay, Some former students, I think. Too. Yeah. So uh, thanks. Uh, I, 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 I am thankful to Elo School and to Robert, especially, for inviting me here uh, with a broad presentation about what's going on in Eastern Ukraine, but in whole, probably Eastern European region. I've been in a battle zone for six times, and like like on the front line, so there is a battle zone. There's a huge territory, like about like three millions of population of the Eastern Ukraine. But in like the front lines, I was actually two times. One of them it was Slavyansk. It, Slavyansk, this city was occupied first by pro-Russian separatists. But after uh, in uh, mid June, uh, pro-government forces they pulled them out. And the second time was actually near the Pesky. It's uh, the, it's like it's a suburbs of Donetsk, and it's like less than one mile from airport. Donetsk airport, the hottest like. Uh, as Poroshenko put it, the hottest like place in Europe, you know, or something. And I want just to to also emphasize that all this experience and all the views are my own. So this is all my experience. I don't represent any government or non-government organization. Just I want to share my own experience with you, and I will be glad just to. If you don't understand something in my speech because the English is really not perfect, you can interrupt me just for some details, and then we can just continue our discussion. So the first video, just before to start the presentation, uh, the first video is from Donetsk actually airport. This the most uh, dramatic like uh, place in Ukraine and this is not my video, this is video from my colleagues from Babylon so this is a pr production studio and they make a lot of such videos and uh, from the hotspots and I want to say that the, probably for now that's actually it, it's explain, it explains why I'm here because now it's really difficult to, to get the real information even not if you are not in DC but in Kyiv you know? so you have to be on the ground to understand all this specific and all these details um, and uh, I, I'm not. Uh, that's why I'm not very excited about my government because I think that they should do more just to spread the reality of this war because it, it's a uh, full-scale conflict. And this, the five. I want just to emphasize five main facts on this war. So this is the most mythical and strange war uh, in probably whole European history because this is undeclared and nobody actually know even in Ukraine because. It calls not a battle zone, it calls like anti-terroristic operation, but it's not a war. And when some like troops are deployed there to eastern Ukraine and they're wounded or something happens, they are not a veterans actually. So they are participants of anti-terroristic operation, but it's not a war because not a state of emergency, no like declared war. So this is really strange. The second is this uh, the most brutal war since um, World War Two in Europe. This is why so. I will soon. I will, then I will tell you the real casualties. What happens? But officially, uh, US uh, OSC they say that it's four thousand people, including civilians and from both sides and like uh, battalions. Uh, also, this is the most unique war because it's like people's war because uh, eighty around ninety percent of the nations are equipment for Ukrainian army. It goes from people and from volunteers. So. Uh, like uh, me, defense ministries, they provide like if I would be mobilized in the, as a soldier, they will provide me only with like uh, some like best best sort of uniform and just a uh, Kalashnikov, which is not a good one, which is like around 30 years old or something. That's true. The fourth fact is the the uh, the, the first evidence of terrorism actually to me the first evidence of terrorism in Europe and. 
I think that it could transform if, if the conflict will be frozen. I mean, it, to my view, it could be transformed as something as an ISIS state in in the euro. And the fifth, the last but not the least, this is the most um, the tricky war. I mean, just nobody says that they are present here. So, like Russian says that we are not there, but despite this, there are a lot of evidences which even I saw by my eyes what happened there. There's, there are, this, this is obviously Russian's presence in the eastern Ukraine. So before just start the presentation, just a short video. This was made from airport uh, like maybe a month ago or something, but uh, this battle going on right probably in this moment as well. So it's an, an endless like shutting between uh, both sides. And the airport is really strategic uh, s uh, place in Eastern Europe because, like, despite this, it's like almost destroyed. The buildings are almost and terminals are almost destroyed. Actually, it was new. It was built for European football championship 2012. But uh, well, let's the terms. I, I think that the correct will be just call these guys pro-Russian separatists. I mean, this will be correct. Not not terrorists, not rebels, but I mean. And uh, these separatists, they try to seize airport because this um, uh, place where, uh, let's say this, uh, the, the, the road, it's still, uh, it's still, uh, it still works. So if somebody will control airport, it's, it, it means that he uh, can send, the, this side can send their plans, uh, even from Russia or from Ukraine. So. This is like a short video. And you can read, can you read some? <coughs> so this is interview with the right sector activist. He says the benefits about joining the right sector, for example, because he doesn't need to see some paper and to just get some insurance, you know. Are they building their rifles? Is that what they're doing? Are they they're building their rifles? Uh, right? They're preparing their guns? Yeah, 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 sure. sure. You see this is sign of right sector on his right arm. <laughs> This is the beginning. So all the terminals are almost destroyed. Do you see this yellow? I will explain what this. Come on. <laughs> Yeah, and here is an interview. So the, the most interesting facts about this organization, this is really, have you heard something about right sector? I mean, this is very popular in Russian media because they try to myth, uh, just to mythify them. So they are like anti-Semit, uh, neo-Nazi or something like this. So the most mythical organization probably, and the most mentioned po political party after uh, uh, the main Russian pol party, like, so they mentioned right sector as a second. 
Uh, the interesting fact, if uh, like 80% uh, of them, they have like higher education and even two, probably two PhD. That's why. So people are educated. So uh, actually on the interview, this guy, he said that um, they are volunteers. They are, they are not uh, uh, registered somewhere officially and they do this by their own, or by the, on their own risk. So all that he said. But we, 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 we can come back to the organization. So the first, I think that... Uh, but they're pro-Ukrainian? Yeah, sure, sure. They're pro-Ukrainian, so um, people with actually different background. But I, I will tell you about them, especially. If, if you are interested, you can ask, ask a question, particularly about the rights sector. So um, I think that this, is, this will be important just to show the result of the elections. You see, if you are... Uh, we had parliamentary elections in uh, October 26, uh, so this is the, the, the first after the revolution. We had presidential elections and Poroshenko, he gained uh, like 56% of support. And now we had parliamentary elections in the new parliament in Ukraine. So you can see here the results. So uh, was the, uh, the main party, Poroshenko's party, it's like 21 and uh, 82%. And uh, the difference is it, a little bit more is Narodny Front by Arseniy Yatsenyuk. So you can see some faces, maybe you know them. For example, the, here is the leader Yatsenyuk, he is the current prime minister. And here is the first uh, place took Vitaly Klitschko. He is also, now he is a major, uh, major key major, major, mayor, mayor, right? Mayor. Yeah. And the third place it was by, by Samapomich. Actually, it, it's a political party of uh, war. How the, the most European Ukrainian uh, mayor uh, from Lviv, it's Eastern Ukrainian city, and his name is um, Andriy Sadovy. But despite he didn't, I mean, just his brand was really powerful in these elections, and but he he was not in the list. I mean, he he took probably fifties or something position. So he was more like formal, just a face of the party. But uh, yeah, you can see, and uh, about uh, ten percent uh, it took. Uh, uh, oppositional bloc. Actually, this this guy, all of the, most of these guys, they are from a previous government, so they supported Yanukovych regime, uh, former president Yanukovych regime, and they they are still really close, and they are, they voted for this law for dictatorship, if you remember, which uh, escalated the conflict in January, and now they are in parliament. So we have a joke. How they will go to work right now? You know, so <laughs> somebody can stop them near the <laughs> their work, so near the parliament, near the building. And you can see Timoshenko, Yulia Timoshenko. She she gained around eight percent. And the first place on her uh, list is Miss Savchenko, Nadia Savchenko. So maybe you heard something about her story. She was captured by Russians in uh, probably in, in in early August. August. And um, uh, she actually she is uh, she's in the military and she's in air forces. And now uh, it's really big scandal around her. Uh, I mean, just Russians uh, they accuse her in uh, uh, cooperation, like on killing on like Russian journalists or something like this. So this is really just a symbolic uh, person in Ukrainian history and this conflict. So, but Kishina party, which is motherland party. Uh, who, uh, which leader is Timoshenko? Uh, they decided to put her in the first position. So it's what, what she's not now in jail in Moscow, you know. So it's impossible for her to enter the parliament. But her like candidacy was like maybe some kind of promotion of the political party. And this is funny guy. He's Lashko. I mean, he's he, he, they call this radical party, but actually it's not radical. It's more like how to say it. It's, Joke or, I mean, nobody takes him seriously. Well, so this is the result of the parliament, and they will gather on December 1st, actually on the next week. And the coalition is already just organized, and we will see how they will vote. Also, we have like far, far proportional, far majority, uh, half proportional, uh, half majority system, and actually you, you, you can see everything, uh, all the picture is here. So uh, we really compl complain, right, about this dictatorship law. For example, when the, it was a revolution in Ukraine before Yanukovych left the country, uh, uh, lawmakers they voted for so-called law for dictatorship. About 
to more than 200 230 lawmakers and it means that it it it, it, it was it, it produced even more escalation of the conflict because people were all, already angry and they became even angrier because of this law it restricted even to wear a helmet or balaclava or something it's like a ridiculous law but about uh, 60 65 uh, I don't remember for sure, they now again uh, join the parliament right now, so it will be interesting situation inside. So let, let's go about to the situation on the ground. So uh, the, the most interesting thing will be just to understand who fights between just both sides. Um, I would say that uh, now we have around uh, 100, uh, 100 thousand military men in the Ukrainian army, and budget is around one and seven billion dollars per uh, a year. Just to compare with the Russian budget, it's about 85, if I don't, 85, 86 billions. Right. So you can understand that our army is really poor, uh, literally poor, because like um, there were, I mean, just like nobody expected to this war. Nobody couldn't even imagine for like a year ago that we will fight against Russians. It will be like full scale conflict. And um, this is interesting, I, I, I would say that it's interesting phenomenon about volunteer battalions which were organized in Ukraine on this, uh, um, during this conflict. So you can see uh, here all of these guys, like five of commanders, they became uh, lawmakers. So it's extremely popular right now in Ukraine for politicians to go to the not like front line, but like maybe to Ato to make some picture, you know, to uh, to have a uniform and say that I was on the war. So this is extremely popular, and they use it in advertisement, you know. That so actually I I, I can't just uh, discuss about these guys. Only only two of them I know personally. So I can tell only about Mr. Berez and Mr. Yarosh, who are the leaders of uh, Berez. And he's uh, actually told them all of them became a lawmakers. Uh, they were elected, for example, Yarushki was elected on majoritarian districts in his own area when he was born in near Dnipropetrovsk, its central Ukrainian city. And Mr. Uh, Beryoza, he was in Yatsenyuk's list, like Narodny Front, People's Front list. He took like fifth position or something. Uh, also, this guy, he was, uh, uh, well, actually, Andriy uh, Bilecki, well, so. Uh, he was jailed during previous uh, during Yanukovych regime, and he was released uh, after uh, the after Yanukovych left the country. He is a head of Battalion Azov. I can say that this is the most radical organization, uh, and um, he, he uh, despite this, they expressed their radical views. I mean, it's not a Nazi or something like this, but they say that we are from right. I mean, just really radical things. But despite this, he was elected in Kiev. Because his main uh, competitor, he was a uh, representative of party of regions. So people prefer this radical guy who really fights on the eastern Ukraine than the former like lawmaker from like past government. So, uh, and uh, I think we can estimate around ten thousand so people in this volunteering battalion. So. Uh, it's really interesting question why they don't join the regular army. For example, when I talked to some of guys from right sector, he said to me, for example, I don't want to decide sort of bureaucracy. Uh, I don't know physical test. I don't want just some like uh, to be in somebody's database. I don't want police to watch on me. And I don't know just like I don't want my children to know that I'm in this battalion, you know. So this is like. Uh, it's the most simple way to get to war just to join the battalion because the, the not too many bureaucracy it's one of the benefits uh, the second is uh, that uh, the problem of this war actually what is still continuous because there are a lot of betrayers right betrayers in Ukrainian military headquarters so let's put in this guys from right sector they say if somebody knows about the our further operation somebody knows who is uh, higher than the mayor, like rank mayor, mm -hmm. we don't do it. You mean it means that they for sure? For example, there were some situations when, um, well, it was some like uh, paratroopers. They wanted to ma make like experiment, right? And he, he said that uh, okay, we've we received a, uh, an order to hold this position, 
but let's do the, the, the following. We won't say this to our government, I mean, just to our commanders, but we will change the position in a few miles, like left or right, another way. Even they didn't come to this position, it was completely destroyed by enemy's artillery. So it means that somebody was waiting for them. And the, I think that the betrayers in Ukrainian are just among the commanders, it's a really huge problem. And when you are in volunteering battalions, actually they don't have any like commanders among like official militaries. So they do by their own. They they own op like local operations. Mm -hmm. So it's more like a family where people trust to each other, and when nobody knows for sure what they are they are going on to do next. So this is really important. And yeah, so uh, actually. Four of these battalions, except right sector, they are officially registered. For example, Donbass, it's like a part of the mm, uh, interior ministry. And uh, uh, Aydar also, there is, it's not mentioned in Aydar. For, some of them belong to interior ministry, some of them belong to uh, defense ministry. But uh, yeah, but they, are more up, uh, they have more rights and they're more uh, up, uh, autonomic, autonomic right? Autonomous, right? Um, yeah, so um, yeah, there are a lot of interesting facts, and the, the average is about 10,000. And it's really interesting fact because, for example, in the Donetsk airport, when I was in Pieski, uh, it, it's a real story when some regular militaries, you, you have to understand that it's really close uh, uh, nations like Russians and Ukrainians. I mean, uh, did you see these yellow labels? Yeah. It means that if you are in Ukrainian army, if you are like fight for Ukraine, you just labor yourself. You, you, everybody shot each other. Everybody used the same mixed kind of uniform which volunteers send. So this is, which could be sent by volunteers or like some jeans or something, you know? And everybody speaks the same language. That's the problem. So you can't understand who is this shouting. I mean, he speaks in Russian and, and you speak in Russian. That, that's the problem. And people just label themselves, but for example, uh, Separatists, they prefer to use white one, and our they usually yellow, and they use it on cars, you know, so two lines, like white lines, I will show you on the picture. And this is really just interesting because sometimes it, it happened that, like, for Russians, they use Ukrainian symbols to uh, capture people, just to, to manipulate, you know, just they say, oh, oh, hello, just like in Ukrainian, and people just trap them, and they, they shot them. And for example, it, it happened with the right sector after my movie, it was uh, August 12th. I was on the head, uh, database, in, in the, also in the uh, battle zone. I was in the headquarters, in the, the training camp actually, in the battle zone. And after I uh, <laughs> left, in like one week, hold this uh, bus of the activity, this, uh, their troops were shot because they confused the checkpoints. They thought that it was Ukrainian, and they told to them in Ukrainian, no, come on, come here, we are, and they just killed maybe at least 20 guys. Mm -hmm. This is the truth. Yeah. Um, who fights on their side? I mean, just, I would like to distance myself from my nationality and from my views, just to be as objective as possible. I mean, because a lot of here I have, like, pro-Russian sentiments, but I, I, I would like to show the whole picture what happened. So, uh, the main separatists are left. You see their like nicknames is Matarola, Givi, and still call. So the main, like, they're common there. So, um, Matarola and like three of them have Russian background. For example, Strilkov, we were discussing with Robert. Uh, he is a colonel of FSB, uh, uh, which is F F FSB, right? Everybody understands. So this foreign security, for, foreign security, security service, right. Security. Russian, yeah. And he was active in the beginning of the conflict. And he is a Russian, obviously, because, well, he said that, okay, I'm not in, uh, in, in FSB, I am retired like two months ago, you know. <laughs> so, something like this. And Givi, actually, nobody knows for sure his background. He said that I'm local, but he looks like really Caucasian guy, you know. <laughs> and Matarola, he's Russian, he was, uh, he was in Russian regular army. And his like uh, biography is really interesting because uh, a lot of time he's like uh, he became like a mem in Ukrainian media and everybody discussed his private life. He has a two wife, you know, so it's like sort of soap opera. 
Uh, despite he was married, he married again on Ukrainian in, 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 in Eastern Ukraine. So this is really interesting story. And he had like a, actually before the war, he just was a car washer. Like, uh, yeah, this is true actually. So this is really interesting, the faces of this so-called uh, Donetsk and Lugansk People Republic. So this is really interesting. And for sure we know that uh, uh, to this, uh, this uh, 76 uh, Pskov Airborne Division, they were detected in eastern Ukraine. Um, well, it's really interesting to understand. I mean, some Russians, they always ask, you, you, you need to prove us. So um, the, the best way to, to, de to detect the pro-Russian troops is to search their social media. So they are they also like people as we are, and they like to use Vkontakte. This is like some uh, sort of like Russian-made Facebook, and they check in somewhere in Ukrainian border in uniform with artillery, with the tanks and all the this. So this is the best proof. Or, or he say like I'm in, like some private guy. I mean he's a private. He doesn't have any rank. He say I'm in Ukraine. Hello, we are preparing our artillery for shelling so on. So. It's, it's really, in having social media and background, it's really simple just to understand who are they and where they come from and what is their background. Of course, if you found somebody from this division, you can see like all his history in social media, where he was, where he was located before, even his private life. So this is not, this is really simple, I mean. And uh, or of course, when uh, some like, uh, I, I didn't see like, especially I didn't see like, killed like Russians by myself, but I heard from my friends for whom I trust that uh, they found some of these um, unkilled guys, they found either tattoo of the divisions, you know, because this is the leader force in Russia, or something like uh, Chevron, like, yeah, we call it Chevron or something like mm -hmm. this. Yeah, all these, uh, badge, 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 raid, all these divisions, so, but they tried to just to cut it before, that, so they say that we are volunteers, we are not in the regular army, but we understand this. And also, um, well, separatist battalions, also they have Aplot, Vostok. Well, uh, well, some of them were organized, uh, I would say, for example, Aplot, uh, it's, um, it's more Caucasian. You know? uh, so, uh, people are there from Chechnya, well, I, I, they don't like, well, well I, I won't call them Chechens, but obviously they have uh, this Chechen nationality and this is also interesting fact that um, for example you know this uh, Russia they were also engaged in war in Chechnya and some of them these people who fought for independence now they join Ukrainian army like well so there is a Chechen battalion in Ukraine for sure who fights against like Russians that's why. But there are some guys who support Kadyrov's policy, but actually I will, would call them mercenaries, right? Mercenaries, they do it for money, and they join that side. So we can call them like Kadyrovci, well, people who support Kadyrov, and, and some South Ossetians mm -hmm. and so on, like Caucasian battalion. Some battalions were organized like in Ukraine, in Eastern Ukraine, among some criminals, among maybe miners, among people who really believe for this, or, uh, Donetsk and Luhansk republics, I mean, everybody has his own motivation. And so we know about these battalions and we uh, know about Cossack corps. Uh, so Cossacks from Rostov, uh, well, they are everywhere actually, you know, in, 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 in every like uh, conflict where Russians were engaged, uh, we saw these Cossacks in Georgia, Chechnya, probably in, even in Transistria. So they they position themselves they like a Cossacks, we are support Putin and like it's better to Google their history. Actually Cossacks they came from Ukraine but they don't they, they denied it, you know. But uh, around twenty thousand of Cossacks they are they have their own separated battalion and uh, when it's like a, some sort of ceasefire where there are there are not so active like uh, clashes, they fight between each other. You know? <laughs> yeah, that's true. Before Kazakhs between like Chechens or something like this. Yeah, because you, you have to understand what happens on the ground. Because people share the spheres of interest. I mean, it's obviously they they didn't came here for any idea. Well, maybe like ten percent, maybe twenty percent, but not more. Everybody wants to have a car or just to take somebody somebody's house or something like this. This is true. 
or the good business is just to take a hostages and then just either to exchange or just to directly to sell them for money to their relatives. It's a business actually mm -hmm. for most of them. But this their, is a their, true. Their history is they were tribesmen, so does this come down to their history of working tribes made up of tribes and tribes? Whom, whom do you mean, Cossacks? Yes. Uh, yeah. uh, well, if you're interested in their history, I can say that they moved from Ukraine during the Soviet Empire and they were always separate. So, I, I mean, they, they consider themselves as a Cossacks. We are not Russians, we are Cossacks and we are a little, or I'm just like, but they are very, how to say, they, they, they really, I mean, just, they, it's, it's typical Russian Orthodox. They preserve uh, Christian values. Like even they try to, the, for example, there are very interesting, like interesting story about them from the front, uh, from what what they doing in eastern Ukraine. For example, they uh, they organized uh, a law, okay, their law, which forbidden to women to go outside after 7 p.m. And if they will, they will be punished because it's not traditional, you know, to be a woman or just to dress some t-shirt or something, you know. So they. I, 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 this is an old orthodox, uh, like fundamentalist, Russian mm -hmm. fundamentalist, I call oh, it okay. So, and uh, they still like have this sort of punishment by beat people just with uh, some like, the whips. Yeah, like, or something, you know, oh. just do it publicly, you know. There are a lot of videos that they say, this guy, he was like, he raped somebody or he stole something and he should be just uh, punished in this way. So, I, 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 I don't understand, I mean, just like, and they drink a lot, of course, as Russians. <laughs> <laughs> they always drunk, probably. So if That's you see their <laughs> their commander's interview, they are always drunk. Uh, to be you know, so. so maybe we have about. Why don't you take five more minutes? No, no problem. Questions. So um, and we'll have a lot of okay, and uh, the, uh, below you can see this uh, Russian media outlet. So I can I I I can explain that their media is so powerful they even my relatives from eastern ukraine they don't talk to me they say that i'm junta or i'm just fascist mm -hmm. you can imagine how powerful it is so my relatives say why did you came to my land why are you shelling us we want to be a separate and so on and so this is like they are not like far from it's like my cousin yeah so this level it's not so the russian is really powerful for example you live in some village in eastern ukraine and somebody shelling us and Russian TV said that this do, do exactly like Ukrainian forces, despite Ukrainian forces are in another place. But they believe what media says. And there are like few uh, sort of Russian media. This is the first national channel, the Russia Today, if you know, probably here, and Russia 24 and NKV. So all the Russians and actually all they do when they come to some city, the first is they, or village, they cut off the Ukrainian TV channels. So the propaganda is really powerful. And the alternative media, which I do really respect in Russia, I mean, so Russia, somebody says that all, uh, Russia was always like this. But the, this is a obvious example of what happens about uh, like Echo Moskvy, the famous radio station, or no, new, uh, Nova Gazeta newspaper, or uh, Dosh TV channel, which is Rain TV channel. This is really famous and it's really, really like liberal way of thinking and just uh, they provide objective information even regarding the situation in Ukraine. So they try to evaluate both sides, just just they think critically and so on. So I mean th th that's why it happens in media and how it's influenced local people in Eastern Ukraine. So the real casualties, I think that it, it's my own like opinion and it's my own amount, uh, it's my own uh, data. Well, so OEC said that around 4,000 people were killed, including civilians. But I think about Ukrainian combatants when it comes, it's not less than 8,000 people. So, uh, as you know, Ukraine was engaged in Afghanistan war in 2019, uh, 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 so 10 years in Afghanistan. Ukrainian, like Soviet Ukrainian Republic, and our people were present. And a lot of veterans of Afghanistan, they are engaged in this war and they fight either from pro-Russian separatists or from pro-Ukrainian. So I told, I interviewed some of this guy and he told that Afghanistan, it was a honeymoon for us. <coughs> so all Afghani, all this Taliban, all they had, it was like American like stingers or some like uh, Kalashnikov machine guns. 
but they didn't use like multi-missile Huragan or Grad or something like this, which destroyed everything, which shot for like two, two, uh, 20 miles. So you're sitting here and they started from 20 miles and you have like, you can only see how it comes to you and it's destroyed everything. It's, it's, I, I mean, you, you should be really lucky <laughs> to hide from this. So I, I think that the real casualties for the six, six months, we've lost more people than we lost during the whole <coughs> campaign in Afghanistan. At least we lost 8,000 people. Official, they say that we've lost 1,000 killed Ukrainian soldiers, but I think that it's at least it's 8,000. And about casualties, usually it counts like four times more. So for example, if we have 1,000 kill, it's at least 4,000 pounds. What are these numbers based on? Just your observations? No, no. Your this is this is my observation. Yeah, I, I mean facts, and I can describe why then. And about civilians, I don't know. I can say it for sure, but usually it counts one to five. For example, if one combatant, I mean it's like in general. It's not only in Ukrainian conflict, but it, it's whole, whole conflict. It's one combatant killed. It means five times more civilians. I mean it's like constant. Uh, formula. Well, uh, so around 400,000 of displaced people, and some of them forced were some some of them moved to Russia, some of them moved to Ukraine. So and some of them who hadn't possibility they stayed. Uh, uh, mostly older people and people who didn't have just choice. For example, my uh, uh, girlfriends parents, they live in Donetsk, but they live in downtown and they see that it's quiet. Everything is happening in suburbs, but her uh, father, he he works, he's a miner, he still works in this place and nobody, actually he said that nobody touched like, like locals, but anyway, so some people stay because of their needs. Somebody used to leave to Russia. The, the total amount of people who were displaced is about 400,000 people, maybe more, I don't know. Um, some villages you can see here, it's like below here, some villages like Semenovka, Krasnodon, I mean some villages, I, I, I told you about uh, multi-missile, this Grad or Huragan artillery, you, you can just google it and see how it works, so it's destroyed everything on one square mile, everything, so some villages were almost destroyed, nobody knows how many people were killed there actually, so, so this is the fact. And this is also interesting fact about volunteering support. Uh, I mean, as I told you, 80%, 80-90% of Ukrainian army is donated from volunteers. I mean, people who just spend their own money, their own time, and of course, just they deliver this help directly to the front line, and a lot of them were missed, tortured, and killed because they do it for their own risk. Just to, and everybody helps how he or she can. I mean, it could be either uniform or just to donate money or just like, uh, we have some organization, this is Army Source, which calls. They, they even just reconstruct some vehicles, Russia, uh, like military vehicles, like tanks and uh, like, like this. So they do everything possible. So I, I don't know what would do our Ukrainian army without their donations and their support of of this scale. Of course people risk their lives and the main international donors of course obviously the United States in the first position but I mean no, well obviously nobody cares about the conflict in Ukraine since it doesn't touch them but uh, the most Ukrainian allies, allies you can see here and I think that we should add more like Poland, um, Latvia, Lithuania and Georgia. I mean people who knows, like government who know what what Russian invasion it means. So they understand and for example Polish uh, they understand what would be if they occupied whole Ukraine. It's obviously that they will move further. So uh, Polish are also very um, very active just to send our, for example it could be even old cars which is reconstructed and used like for medicine, like for emergency. Or this is really famous, we call it uh, like, uh, this is sort of truck when you can establish a machine gun on the roof and it, it was really um, uh, 
successful Middle East, you know, also it gives you mobility. You, you can it, you you can just like always move uh, and something like this. And here is also probably it will be. Um, so uh, when every, everybody say, uh, a lot of say that th this is a really terrible situation in Ukraine, you shouldn't go there. Actually, it's not true. If you go uh, like from like 20 miles from the front line, you will see the the, the usual life. You will go, go to disco, to shopping. They are relaxed. They just, I mean, just they they live their usual life. So you can see the whole map in Ukraine of Ukraine, right? And only here conflict, like it's like three percent of Ukrainian territory. So when somebody says about that Ukraine should be divided and a lot of pro-Russian, so it's all it's okay. So we don't put Crimea because there are Russians also. Uh, so it destroys, like obviously destroys this myth because all this territory where this uh, Russian presence who just donate, like who feed separatists, only here conflict happens. So. Closer, we, we can see this Slavyansk, it was occupied before, but now it's released. And there is a uh, Donetsk airport is here, and all of this territory, probably part till Mariupol. So I was I was in Donetsk airport not far, I was here when it was occupied, I was also in Mariupol like, like last week. And here is now Novozovsk, from here this is a Russian border, right? And of here in this place, this is a Navazov, this is a small like 30,000 people and it's occupied with Russian tanks and somebody says that if Putin will decide to, I mean he desperately needs for sure the land corridor to Crimea right now and if he will decide to move further he, 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 he needs to take Mariupol and hold this like Ukrainian area so he, he can he can make from three sides. Here is Transistria, uh, which is also have Russian presence. Here is Crimea and here is Russian border. So they can move from like three sides just to occupy southeast, just to make a land corridor to Crimea. But it's only one of like, well, nobody knows what will be for sure. What about Luhansk? Uh, Luhansk is also occupied, you can see it here. Oh. It's, it's here. Yeah, sorry for these <coughs> graphics, but it's not far from Donetsk and it's really close for uh, and this is Svarino and I, I will tell you if you want the details from the ground what what happened during these six months I can explain you more why don't you conclude your talk and then we'll get some questions yeah I think that the most likely scenarios in Ukraine scenarios in Ukraine so all of these pictures all of these pictures of Russian troops it was made in uh, it was made, we took this from their social media they checked in in Ukraine, and yeah, the moving of their multi-missile launch, and yeah. So, uh, well, the, it, obviously, it's not the whole list of scenario, scenarios what can happen, but uh, escalation of conflict, Russian direct invasion, and just striking this uh, corridor uh, to Crimea. And another is just to this is frozen conflict, so they will escalate the, the their uh, the conflict and increase the number of their presence on that side. So this is like two of the most possible uh, what 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 we have on the table right now. And what are uh, greatest concerns? And I, I think that this is, this is what, what can stop actually a Russian invasion. It's also like my own. It's my own opinion and my colleagues. It's like an additional sanctions. It's really powerful, and uh, failing of uh, prices of oil. Of course, this is really it, it, it has impact. And granting, of course, like uh, for for example, I, I I forgot to tell you because there is a really interesting organization here, Russian combatants in Ukraine. So there is a, on Facebook there is a page of a committee of soldiers mothers. Uh, who whose sons are in Russia, mm -hmm. and the leader of this organization, I, I, I we can Google it, but I, I forgot exactly her name. But she says that about four thousand Russians, Russian troops were killed in Eastern Ukraine. So well, it, it like it was during Afghanistan. So nobody uh, do this, uh, nobody do some ceremonials when uh, nobody say about this. They are buried, were buried, buried like highly, you know. So, and even like guys from this Dost Rain TV channel, they try to investigate some like fresh 
um, graves on the cemetery from like par some paratroopers and they were just persecuted or something like this and the lawyer who tried to investigate he was high, uh, badly right beaten mm -hmm. by some guys you know and he he was in hospital I don't know what was his future but they try to uh, of course there are casualties of Russian troops and this organization they say that around 4,000 soldiers but nobody knows for sure how many well so uh, what I wanted to tell you uh, so this uh, this weapon, uh, 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 considering uh, a weapon, as more as Putin will understand that Russia will uh, um, lose more of their troops uh, on the ground in Ukraine, as less he will be active in eastern Ukraine. So obviously, yesterday we received these radars and other system from the United States, and obviously it will stop. Probably it's the most powerful fact for like Putin and for his like for Russian troops not to continue their invasion, that's why. And of course, they, we, we, we can say there are a lot of discussions in Russian media that says that, well, if we, we will kill a lot of Russians, they will stop. It's not actually true because we have effects when, I mean, just this is another mentality and another like political system. So they last around 17,000 17, kills in Chechnya for like two years and nobody like even go went to protest or something. So uh, the best deal with their relatives is just say that your son was a hero and you receive some like uh, financial support. Otherwise you can be like persecuted or jail. So of course parents understand that we don't have a choice, we can change the system. It's better to take money and just to stay calm. And that's why. But and only few of them will go to protest and or organize some like really. So I mean just I, I, I'm not sure that Russians' uh, casualties in eastern Ukraine have really just big impact to, uh, to, 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 to uh, their, like, uh, to Putin's plans. Mm -hmm. Why so. don't I stop you there? That's okay. Yeah. We'll, have, we'll have some time for questions. So, if you have a question, uh, please identify yourself and ask away. So, I'll start with Peter Roberg. Peter Roberg, Iris. I have a quick question. Why do those people from the Bravo uh, Sector that, that you that, that were filmed there speak Russian? I mean, this is, yeah. is, is this their native language, or would, should they <coughs> prefer Ukrainian? Actually, well, so uh, uh, I have short movie. I mean, this is not perfect because the budget was like few hundreds. And we made it in the summer in right sector camp, so you, you can see it, and maybe you can find some answers here. I mean, I, I'm trying to explain. Uh, anyway, just like, don't justice like judge me critically, you know. But <laughs> I'm not professional. I'm just I, I'm typing, but not just making. Uh, is there the is a song? Ukrainians from from Eastern Ukraine, well, many of most do speak Russian, but they're still in Ukraine. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, I will explain you. If there is a sound, I mean. Yeah. Ah, uh, 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 okay. I don't know. Today, hundreds of volunteers joined volunteer organization to fight against Russian parties on the eastern Ukraine. Okay, I will explain you. Well, we came to a place where uh, Mr. and Mrs. So this guy, he is an activist of right sector, and they just gather uh, the donations for. Uh, he's a volunteer actually, and they gather with his wife. They gather the donation for this organization uh, for people who are on the front of right sector political party from Cherkasy. In Cherkasy, which, which is like central Ukraine. Along with hundreds of different volunteers. So he is preparing his wife. He just like. So there are like different like like I mean everything from so socks to like I mean some equipment for for uh, for guys on the war. So they just it's gather it by themselves in the region. So some socks for Ukrainian soldiers, and you can see people just brought it. Uh, just somebody the brought it by themselves. Somebody bought it. I mean just it's different. First checkpoint. This is a typical checkpoint. Uh, just like. Check, usual checkpoint in uh, Dnipropetrovsk. From Donetsk. So we, we met guys from another volunteering battalion, which is Dnieper, and they say that this is a trophy, you know. They, they just released the city 
and found Ukrainian flag in, in, in administration building. And they just took them and they are proud. And they said, they will, we will keep this with us. So, so this flag is from Amkivka. It's 2,500 well, kilometers from no, no, they're, they speak Russian, but it means nothing. I mean, I also speak Russian. Yeah, the flag is Ukrainian, of course. Like that. Now we are here on volunteering camp. This is right there, tra training camp. All these people are here, are, they are volunteers and just like volunteerly join Ukrainian. They cooperate actually with Ukrainian army. Uh, basically it's our so this guy, he is an activist of right sector. He is like in uh, he is a uh, in the military and he speaks English. Where are you from? Uh, no more information. He doesn't want to answer where he's from. He doesn't want just his mother to see or something, you know. Mm -hmm. And this is like where they live. It used of and it used to be a child camp, camp summer camp. But they just occupied it like recently, and they stayed this train there and go to operation from this camp. And you see this like people who brought it, just sala if you know, <laughs> and some meat. And they capture some separatists, pro-Russian separatists, and they hold them in dungeon. Five days ago, on one of the checkpoints, these five guys. So there, it's like their prison when they hold these pro-Russian separatists. But it's obviously, when you talk to them, they are say that we are for Ukraine. We are. We, 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 I don't know what happened, and etc. But people say they were with Kalashnikov. They are like separatists, you know. Soviet. It's a machine gun. You can see it's 1984. Yeah, Cement, he says that he took it from separatists, from killed. Uh, so this is a trophy, this machine gun is trophy, this guy took it from killed separatists. I mean, from Russian separatists, okay. Uh, separatists, and he can prove that it was made in Russia. And it was some kind of subtitles. There is a training some. Dramatically every day, more and more Ukrainian women and men join battalions to fight against pro-Russian separatists on the east. This is really desperate guy, actually. Uh, his, I mean, everybody has his code name. I mean, even if they are together, nobody knows. Maybe he or she do, doesn't know his friend's name because everybody try to use their password. So this guy is Da Vinci. I don't know why he's Da Vinci, maybe he's a good painter, but he's 18 years old, really. And he's like a desperate guy, and he's in Donetsk airport, he was several times, he was wounded two times, and then came back to the front line, so this is a really interesting story. He's a good sniper, actually. So here I would like to under, uh, explain, so, uh, well, obviously it's logical that government should equip these guys, right? Just to send them weapon, just to protect the country, but they don't. Why? They don't provide them with even like with weapon, with, with like vehicles or something like this, because they're scared. So government don't, doesn't want these guys to come back to Ukraine, to, to Kyiv, to find the traitors or to, to stand against the government. So the main like uh, uh, enemy for government is it's is, is really just uh, uh, it's unbelievable. But the main like uh, enemy of government is not Russian troops because America can protect us, okay? But like this is volunteer battalions because nobody controls them. If they will give them weapon, they can pursue their political uh, some political goals. So they say, if you won't give this order, we come back to Kyiv and demand to do this. Mm -hmm. And nobody will shoot them because these guy, the guys are desperate, they well organized, they're experienced, and they have a weapon. So this is really just possible scenario. Do we have a couple more questions?
Yes. Eleanor Bachrock. I um, worked for USAID in Ukraine for uh, five years, so I feel very attached uh, and upset about this. Uh, your list of um, countries uh, contributing, are these contributions from government, from private people, both? If it's from private people, how do they make their contributions? And why isn't Canada in the list? They've got lots of recruitment. How they do the contributions? Yeah. yeah. Well, this is a really interesting question, because on the beginning of the conflict in April, May, everybody sent it directly to the defense ministry. Okay, so let's send them like 20,000 and they will decide what to do because they are just more like competent in this situation. But then 80% of this amount has disappeared. Oh. That's a problem. Mm -hmm. So when I sent it as a volunteer, if, as a, you have to understand because like volunteers, they provide Ukrainian army with some really expensive things <coughs> like night vision, which cost about 20,000 or something. And it's not a good idea to to give it to some commander or something. So you have to know this person. And usually people just send the address help. Just to go by themselves, just to, to organize the transportation, organize this thing, and they know what this division needs, most of all. For example, this battalion needs night vision. This needs like some warm clothes. This needs some like food or something like this. But, but I'm asking about the foreign countries, so you, the list of foreign countries. I mean, you can't just drive in from the United States. Uh, yeah. These are Americans? If you are private. Yeah. If you are like private person, not yeah. government, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think you had a question? Yes, yes uh, my name is Brian Marshall. I served, hey, with, I, I served with OSCE and as a long-term observer over there in several missions, but never in the fighting area. Um, <clears throat> but my question is, among likely scenarios, uh, is one that's very disturbing, and that is potential economic crisis for Ukraine. Uh, the value of the arena is uh, falling rapidly. Can you comment on that situation? Uh, the scenarios, right? The poten yes, uh, potential economic crisis. Well, so uh, I think that Putin is a, he is a smart guy, actually. <laughs> and he, he, what, what he wants to do now, and I, I, if I would be on his position, or, which I don't want to, <laughs> but anyway, uh, now he, um, his main, uh, he wants to make a military coup co in Kyiv. <coughs> Military coup. 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 I mean, he understands that it's impossible. I mean, it will, it will people. I mean, he didn't expect that people from Eastern Ukraine, which used to be pro-Russian region, he would fight. They would fight. He expected to be, to get it for free, like it was in Crimea, just for a couple of weeks, no casualties, not even even without any shot. But there he didn't expect, I mean, he's like Dugin or another guy who are engaged in this propaganda. I think that it was his main mistake. He didn't expect that people on this eastern far eastern Ukraine, they will fight and they will consider themselves as Ukrainian. And it will even increase like patriotic feelings of Ukrainians, even Russian speaker, uh, who, who, uh, Russian speakers, right? So he didn't expect, it's obviously, uh, in, in, in case of direct intervention, I mean, it used to be a great, like, aftermath. I mean, just sanctions, even more, like, international pressures, and people will fight. I mean, because, like, now in these volunteering battalions, you can fight everybody, like, some, like, students, some professor, some guy's manager, or, the, and just everybody, all this society. So there is even, like, I can just describe a common, like, uh, volunteer. I just come on portrait of volunteer. Who is he or she? There are also some women, maybe like 10%. Or like he's a student, or he's a, a, he's an, a scholar, or a manager, or something like this. You know? And also, people are willing to fight. That's, that's the main problem. And the, now there's thousands and thousands more reservists. There are a lot of like private initiative, which train people how to fight when they even di di didn't uh, care weapon before. They know how to make it, and they're willing to fight. That's the question. So the best idea will to be make some to destabilize the situation in the capital. 
you know, so it will be much simpler to take it. Yeah, uh, Jim Britton, independent researcher. Uh, you showed five volunteer battalions there, yeah. and it's my understanding that uh, uh, Pravi Sector is both a combat battalion, of course, and a political party. Is that correct? Yeah. All right, what about the other five, and would you comment on the Azov Battalion, which, uh, as I understand it, they actually tried to portray themselves as being fascist uh, or yeah. neo-Nazi yeah, yeah. uh, and descendants of the uh, Waffen SS Galician Division. Yeah, yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, uh, well, so Azov, uh, well, what, what can I say about, I, I know Bilecki personally, mm -hmm. I mean, so I interviewed him many times. I mean, uh, they, they, they don't hide that we are uh, national socialists. socialists. Well, so this is Nazi, actually. But I'm not sure, I mean, he ran for the elections in majoritarian district, and he won. He, he was in prison for like three years before the previous government. But I mean, for example, when we say about right sector as a radical organization, despite their, it's a really interesting question, because they're really just active just to fight for their own land. And they lost a lot of people, like maybe like young guy like me. And despite this, they gained only like about two percent on the elections. So which is nothing. So it means this so society that people don't trust and don't support. I mean, the, and I'm not sure if Azov is it's 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 only even a, 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 a political party probably. Well, some of the the leader he ran and he is law lawmaker. But I mean, just I talk to these people. I I I can't consider them like a Nazi. I mean, I, I met some of them in Mariupol or in Kiev. They're also very active. But I can't say about the radical. I, I don't I don't think they have any perspectives in Ukraine. Okay. One more question. Yes, please. Yes. Um, so you mentioned the uh, possibility of a military coup in Kiev yeah. that Putin instigated. Yeah. So is the is there a possibility uh, what should we, not so much a possibility but is the reason why you support the uh, increased support for the militia groups in case the government is undermined and you need sort of an escape patch for the pro nationalist part of the of Ukraine? Sorry, I didn't understand so it was really fast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering if you support the, the militias be personally, yeah, because uh, if there's if the government in Kiev is overthrown, then you'll have some sort of um, alternative force that can fight against the Russians. That's the problem. When I talk to these guys from right sector, and well, where well, they're young, hot, you know, and desperate that we are, we will just destroy everything in Kiev. We will establish a new government, but nobody has a like scenario, like a plan, what to do. Okay, guys. Okay, you can kill a president. You can kill anybody. You have a weapon. It's it's simple, and nobody will resist you among police. So nobody will fight against you. But what you are going to do next? <laughs> nobody can answer. So they're radical, of course, and they're really angry on government because when you are in military and y y you expect the attack not from the front but from the just like from uh, from uh, behind. That's why. So you can't understand why, why if you are going something to the, some operation, somebody just like can just just betray you. Just tell to your enemy, the, your uh, or the, to its artillery, to tell your uh, coordinates, or just their artillery worked really correctly on your position. So somebody sold this information. That's why people are angry. Or, for example, why if I join the <coughs> battalion, if, obviously I'm a patriot, I need a weapon for my government, but they say that we don't, we won't give you a weapon because you're like criminal or something, you're illegal. We, we, we won't provide you with a weapon. So it's a really complicated question. And um, well, and, 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 and we had like for like for like two months, we have around three provocations near president's administration. So the first was and when guys from National Guard, like which is like Ukrainian forces, they went to the uh, 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 president's administration to demand uh, to de to to demobilize demobilize demobilization, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So they say that we are we uh, we stayed we overstayed for six months. We need just to go home and so. But but then we, we found in the social media journalists they found that the coordinator of these guy guys she she was a 
women with uh, from Russia and some radical organization. She was along the, among them. That's why. So of course, it's some they will like Russians. I mean, pro Russian, they will increase a lot of the number of provocation just to blame the government. They did nothing. They did didn't any reforms. You know, and for example, the poverty is also the great problem. For example, the currency, it's inflation in Ukraine. But I mean, we, we've paid eight hryvnas, like hryvna is national Ukrainian currency. We've paid eight hryvnas before the revolution for dollars. Now it's around 16. So people became extremely poor. It means that it will radicalize the society. People demand changes. People demand to, ch to reset the system. People demand like normal life after the revolution. But they can do it, couldn't receive it. It means that they will radicalize, and nobody knows how it will be finished. So, I, uh, I, yeah. So. Thank you. Okay, so we're running out of time. I think Nick will stick around for a few more minutes. If you have questions, you can come up and ask on a personal basis. But please join me in thanking Nick for an excellent presentation. <laughs>